of Black History. That was just like an introduction. The second week, which was last week, we looked at the contributionism perspective. So we looked at the element of high culture, high development, accomplishments and achievements of Black people or people of African descent. This we're going to look at the catastrophic perspective. So here, if we look at things, we will look at the catastrophic perspective, which is here. And this is basically, was this, I'm really taking it from the theoretical principles and understandings of Orlando Patterson. Orlando Patterson is a Jamaican sociologist who works at Harvard University. I'm not sure if he's still alive, but he's contributed immense literature looking at the relationship between Black people in the Americas, Black people in, in the West Indies or the Caribbean islands, as well as Black people in the British Isles and looked at the relationship that Black people have had with other groups of people, mainly Europeans, or people from the British Isles. This, 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 this needs to be emphasized as well, because they're all from English speaking, um, they're all English speaking, which means they came from Britain in the first place. Canadians, Americans, you know, the, the English people that went, or the English speaking people that went to the Caribbean islands, New Zealand, Australia, they all come from here. So he says that when black history is taught, it's usually, for, it's usually taught through these three premises or paradigms. So last week we looked at contributionism. Now we're going to look more into the history which many of you yourselves may be familiar with. And that is the catastrophic. So we're going to be looking at different invasions that went into Africa, the slow destruction of black or African culture, and the dispersion of its people into the new world. Next week, we're going to be looking more at slavery or the enslavement period. We're going to be looking at, you know, slave rebellions and struggles, different uh, laws which were passed in Britain and America to abolish the slave trade, to abolish slavery. And we're going to be looking at the Haitian Revolution, which I think is important because it was the first black republic in the Western world in 1804. Not just that, it was the first time that women actually voted in the Western world. And believe it or not, it was black women who were the first women to vote in the Western world. This is in 1804 when they voted Dessalines in. Okay, white women, unfortunately, didn't get the vote until after 1920. So the first people to vote in the Western world, okay, were Daskin people. And this was in Haiti. And I will just talk more about that next week. So let's have a look. So let's have a look at the slow fall of African culture or civilization. So here we're looking at the different forms of civilizations that rose up and came in and literally destroyed African civilization to some extent. So the first group to invade Africa from a historical perspective were the Hyksos. They seem to have come from Palestine. They were known as the Shepherd Kings, and they came in either between 1720 or 1650 BCE. And I believe that at the, the, the time when we look at the time of the prophet Abraham or Ibrahim, it was during the time when he went to Egypt with his wife, Sarah. It was at the time that the Hyksos were in rule, or they were ruling at that time. This is what is believed. So it seems to be a Semitic group or an Indo-European slash Semitic group of people that took over parts of Africa during this particular period. So you had outsiders ruling strategic parts of Africa, which is known as the Hyksos. They were there from dynasties, if my memory serves me right, dynasties 14, 15, and 16. And they were only there for a couple hundred years. And then Hamus Nefertari, a dark-skinned woman from Upper Egypt, rose up with Hamos, her, uh, her husband, and fought and kicked out the Hyksos. This is important to know. And that became the establishment of the 17th dynasty, 18th, and so on and so forth. So this was the first invasion that destabilized Africa. And it was only after the 17th and 18th dynasty that Egypt as an empire or as a nation stretched its influence into other areas because it was focused mainly inside Africa. But after the Hyksos were kicked out, you start to see where the ancient Kemites started to stretch into places like Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, into the Iranian Peninsula, into places like Turkey, into the tops of where Mesopotamia is or modern day Iraq. So you start to see where consolidation took place within Africa and they started to stretch outside Africa. Now you have Egypt now becoming an imperial force. 
Then approximately uh, 663 BCE, we got the type likes of the Assyrians. So the Assyrians who came from Nineveh, which is in modern day Iraq or northern Iraq, they came in and took over. So I talked about the early weeks when the 25th dynasty, the Cushitic dynasty in Egypt was ruling under the likes of Pianke, Shabaka, and Tahaka. And Tahaka is actually mentioned in the Bible in Kings. This is important here. Okay, so he's doing, so this was done about the 25th dynasty. This takes place. So the Assyrians are coming with the likes of Ashurbanipal. You've got the likes of Sennacherib. These individuals, very powerful Assyrian leaders. And Syrians, to the most part, are Semitic speaking and have a light skin, but they have a large amount of dark skinned people who've been living in Mesopotamia since the Sumerian era. This is important to know. So it's a con conglomeration of different ethnic groups that create the Assyrian army. This is important to know because a lot of people think when you say Assyrian, we're only talking about Semitic group. No, it's like if you say the American army, you may think of the Anglo-Americans who were originally from Britain, the Anglo-Saxon groups, but you have Jewish Americans, African Americans, Polish Americans, you know, Hispanic Americans, etc. And it was no different in antiquity, this racial composition within an empire or a nation. So the Assyrians come in, and what you start to see from the Assyrian time, which is probably from the 26th dynasty onwards, we start to see in Egypt foreign rulers. And then later on, the Assyrians are taken out with the rise of the Persians. The Persians come into Africa at the time of 325, uh, no, 525 BCE, okay? 525 BCE, the, uh, the Persians come in, okay? And they come in, they cause a lot of destructions. And what you'll notice with these foreign rulers, even though they're pharaonic in their dress sense, in their, in, in, in their cultural practice. They didn't really add anything to Kemetic culture. This is important. And you'll find this. If you listen to the Egyptologists or any of these channels under these particular foreign rulers, they're very, they left very little behind of themselves. And that goes to show how, how um, imperialistic or how influential Kemetic culture was on these foreign rulers. This is what this means here. They had left anything behind. If you go to Egypt today, try to look at the Hyksos period, you'll hardly find anything which they left behind. And it's the same with the Assyrians. It's also the same with the Persians. And the Persians to a large extent were quite brutal in destruction of monuments, etc., and trying to hold out. And what happens is we've got the lives of Alexander of Macedonia that comes in on the scene and he ends up creating a huge empire. And this is where we start to see the Europeans now coming on the scene. Okay, so when the Greeks come in in 332, uh, 332 BC, this is the time of Alexander of Macedonia. Okay, so now you have Europeans ruling now, not so much Indo-Europeans, which are Semitic. You've got European groups uh, ruling in ancient Kemet or Egypt now. And we know that we know about the Ptolemy dynasties where Cleopatra comes from. So this is the Greek dynasty. They are mixed with the indigenous African population because you had to in order to be to legitimize yourself as a pharaoh. Because if you understand pharaonic culture, one of the things that you will come to the conclusion is that you, had, you only could be a pharaoh if your mother came from the royal family or from the royal lineage. So these foreign rulers had to take women from the high class amongst the Kemetic people to legitimize a pharaonic rule. This is what happens. And this is what happened with the Ptolemy dynasty, uh, with the Greek period. And then the Greeks come in, and this is all about the time of Cleopatra now. Okay, so Cleopatra is executed or dies, etc., and then the Romans come in, because the Romans were at the gate. The Romans entered Africa approximately 146 BC when it destroyed uh, Carthage. Okay, so up in North Africa, the Romans were at the gates of Egypt. This is important here, because a lot of people think that when they look at the film like Cleopatra, etc., that the Romans were coming in through the Mediterranean here, and no. The Romans, they'd come from the Mediterranean, but they were at the backside of Kemetic culture during the time of Cleopatra. 
Okay, we know about Caesar and Mark Antony, et cetera, and their exploits, what she's trying to do in order to preserve the dignity of Kemet, because that's what he was called, okay? That's when the name starts to change now. They have called Egypt to a large extent, because Egypt is a Greek word. And then the last one you see, there was other invasions after the Romans, but then you see the Arabs and you see the rise of Islam. And this is an important factor because this, according to Asa Iliad, is where the culture changes now. Okay, so it was still a Kemetic language at the time, even though there was Greeks and Latin, and Latin speakers, etc. The language, the core language, was still from the Africoid language family. This is important here. And this is where the culture changes, where the pharaonic essence falls. Where, you know, around about 639, 640 AD, when Amar ibn al-As, he comes in, and then his nephew goes into North Africa, Uqba ibn Nafih, he goes into North Africa, extends, and then you see a uniqueness of a rise of a group of people known as the Moors. And I'm going to be talking about the Moors, the fall of the Moors, and how we end up where we did today. So this is important here. So you've got different type of invasions coming in to ancient Kemetic culture, rising up, somewhat changing the culture, you know, getting an influence into Africa. But this is literally the last time Africans are now going to rule this particular area. So here, I think I've shown this before, but I'm going to try to show you something. Now, when the Assyrians were coming in, because the Assyrians were brutal, they were harsh. And this was under the Cushitic dynasty, the Nubian Cushites. I talked about Pianke and I talked about Tahaka. Now, this stone head was found in Mexico. And this was found in the Smithsonian Institute, but it was suppressed for about 30 to 40 years. It was an individual who I got in contact with by the name of Wayne B. Chandler, who's a scholar looking at the African presence outside Africa. So he's written many books or written many essays looking at the African presence in Asia, in Mesopotamia, for instance, the African presence in China, which is a Shang dynasty. The Shang dynasty was a, was a black dynasty. This is the first dynasty in China. Okay, and also he talks about the Vidyan civilization in India. So he talks about the African presence and the African contribution in India with Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, these sort of empires, and also Mexico, which, you know, because the belief is, is that when black people came to the so-called Americas, they came as slaves. But these monuments and these colossal heads tell us a different story. For centuries, they were trying to say, or for decades, they were trying to say that this was not an African, this was a baby's head. And they tried to make out it was like an Oriental or a Chinese or Mongolian sort of look. But if you look at the oldest people on the planet, they have those phenotypes as well. The flat nose with the epicantic fault. Then they tried to say that uh, the, 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 this colossal head fell and that's why the face is flat, et cetera, et cetera. But what was conclusive with Smithsonian, which they did not reveal to the world when they came out with this, they never showed the back of the head which would have substantiated the Cushitic or the African presence in America. And this actually shows seven braids, because seven was a sacred number amongst the Cushites and the Kemetic people. So this, was, so, this was, so this was obvious to who they were. Now, this particular head was on a piece of wood, which they carbon dated. And the carbon dating came around about 700, you know, BC to 600 BC. This is what happened. And this was a time of the Cushitic. So what happened when the Assyrians came in, and you can find all this information in the works of Ivan van Sertema. And the book is called, They Came Before Columbus. Okay, but when Ivan van Sertema first uh, wrote the book, etc., it was this head that he showed. He didn't see this part here. This part came in later editions because the Smithsonian was suppressing this information because they were trying to say at the time, especially in the 19, at the turn of the 20th century, that Africans themselves came over the slaves. And Europeans are fascinated with this narrative and they're not really gonna move away from it. This is a narrative they've been made to believe and this is what they're comfortable with. 
to actually bring accomplishments, achievements to Dacian people is very difficult in many European academies and circles where that is concerned. So we're going to be looking at other types of fall. I just want to talk about a couple African women who were very powerful at the time at the Greco-Roman stage of development in Africa and how they fought to keep the Indo-Europeans or Europeans out further extending into Africa. So we've got the likes of Queen Candace, okay? And she was the most powerful queen that came from Kush or what we now call Nubia. So let's have a look at what is being said here. The queens of Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia doesn't mean Ethiopia the country. Ethiopia means, is another way of saying an African or a dark-skinned person. This is what it means. Ethiopia comes from a Greek word which means burnt face. So it's not the country of Ethiopia today. It's people, it, it can mean people who are Djiboutian, Eritrean, Somali, Kenyan, okay, Sudanese, Egyptian. That's what Ethiopia meant. It meant burn-faced people. So this is what needs to be understood here. And we're talking about what the Greeks would have said back at the time when they confronted or encountered these groups of people and started to write about them. So it says the queens of Ethiopia or Nubia, that should be a capital N, sorry about that, who had the name Candace, were noted for their fight against foreign rulers. This is how powerful these women were. Okay, after the death of Cleopatra, which is approximately around about 30 BC, Roman power, Roman power tried to take the Nile Valley, you know, because that was a source of culture, civilization, fertility of the land, etc. So when you go into a place, you've got to try to get to the river or the water or to the streams in order to survive. And this is what the Romans were trying to do at that time of the various queens who had the name Candice, five are known. So there's five Candices who were known. Candice is a word which is a Greek word, which is a concoction or translation of the Kentakes. Kentakes. Okay, so the Kentakes or Candices. So Kentakes is what they call themselves, which basically means queen mother. These Cushitic women were very powerful. An African society, as I said, which a matrilineal or a matriarchal system instilled black female rulers over men. This has only been recent in the European context of things. So it says in Kush, and Kush is an empire now. So it is parts of Upper Egypt, most time Egypt, depending on which, e which era we're looking at. We're looking at Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, some parts of North Africa, into Libya, into Chad. This is Kush. Kush was a mighty empire. And I also talked about Kush being in the southern western part of the Arabian Peninsula, where you've got the likes of Bilqis or Mikida, which is the Queen of Sheba. That was known as Kush when you read the Bible. And another part of Kush is Mesopotamia. Okay, Mesopotamia, which is today modern day Iraq, talking about the Sumerian civilization, they are from a Cushitic people. So they're the oldest people that got their act together, creating culture, creating civilization, and are still in women in the forefront of leadership. So in Kush, the Royal Institute of the Kentucky, the Kentucky's exercise uh, an authority and a degree of political power really enjoyed by their counterpart in Egypt. In other words, like the likes of Hatshepsut and Queen T, Nafatari, Nafatiti, and these individuals here. Okay, so they were much more powerful. They had a level of independence which was far superior than those female rulers of Kemet that I just mentioned, like Hatshepsut and Queen T. Okay, so there was less opposition to her leadership. This is what I'm trying to emphasize here. By the Meroitic period, Mero is in Upper Nubia. In the, uh, in the history of Kush, her authority and influence had become so pervasive, so whispered, that she was able to assume the rulership independently, giving rise to a line of rulers known in history as the Candices or the Kentakets. So this is Queen Candace, who's taken elephants out now to fight the Greeks. And it's, an, it's important for me to emphasize this because these people, these women are never known in history. Okay, they're never known in history. Queen Candace, 
Empress of Ethiopia and General in Chief of its armies, awaiting for Alexander, Alexander's forces, Alexander the Great to cross the new borderline at the cataracts. This is where Upper Egypt and Upper Nubia comes because the Greeks are trying to spread into more Africa now. Alexander having conquered Egypt easily, and now he's easily because he took Egypt. He didn't really conquer it in a sense. Once the, once the Persian Empire had fell, all Persian realms was Greek. That's what happened really and truly. And, they, and the Persians were brutal. So the people of Egypt at the time invited the likes of Alexander in because the Persians didn't treat them too well. So Alexander, having conquered Egypt easily, decided against the invasion of the ancient center of black power and halted his army at the first cataracts. So this woman went out to face the Greek army. Alexander came out of Europe. He went into Afghanistan. He took over India. He went and he, he demolished the Persian empire. Then later on, all the, all the Levant going into Egypt. This man just was conquering land after land after land. And the person that stopped him and halted his extension or expansion was these African queens or these black queens who were the head of armies and the head of leadership in their land. Queen Candice, you can see the elephants there. This is an artist's depiction of how it would have looked at that time, taking elephants out to face the Greeks. So they retreated, the Greeks retreated. This is important. Why is this woman not known in history? Is it because she's black? Is it because she's a woman? Or is it because she's an African? Why is she not mentioned? You always hear about Alexander the Great and this, but you never hear about his defeat. He, this woman defeated him. So we have another queen, Candice, uh, Kentake, Amaranius, Okay, struck back, and this is at the Roman time now. So I'm only looking at two females at the Greek time when the Greeks come in in 332 BC, and when Augustus Caesar comes in around about 30 or 31 BCE. So there's another Kentucky, another Nubian queen who is known in history, who has been left out of the history books, who stopped the Romans from penetrating further into Africa. So at this particular time, between the Greco-Roman period, you had black female rulers in Nubia. Okay, this is important. Or from the empire, which they refer to as Kush. Okay, Kush. So Amaranius struck back at the Roman invasion or invaders under Augustus Caesar. When the Romans occupied Egypt and threatened Nubia, this warrior queen led the Kushite army against the Ethiopian borders, okay? Against the Roman occupied towns and routed their garrison, destroying the statues of Caesar. So the Romans were putting up statues of themselves, you know, on the borderlines within Egypt, etc. And these powerful women went in, struck back at them and they had to retreat. And this is what's important about this. So when we're looking at black culture and African culture, we cannot forget the, the contribution, the achievements and the accomplishments in which black women have played. Most of you who know the African centered perspective or those who were born in this country always hear about black women calling themselves Nubian queens, Nubian queens, Nubian princesses. This is in honor of the Kentuckys. This is what it's about, where they took on the mightiest armies of the time and defeated them but because they were black women you know this has been left out of the history books and this is distortion this is destroying information this is to intentionally confuse this is to falsify this is what this is about so i'm giving you information which is documented out there for you to look for yourself to know how europeans are falsifying the information by not telling by not telling you that black females destroyed the mightiest armies of the Greco-Roman period. We're going to be looking at the Moors. I'm going to give you a little introduction of who the Moors were, where they came from, etc. And this is just um, a little taste because now you're going to see where the black people are going to decline now. So I already told you the Arabs have come in into Egypt approximately uh, 638, 639 AD. Okay, so we're looking at the 7th century AD. They spread into Egypt, okay? They get stopped at Nubia. They get stopped at Sudan. The Arabs don't even enter Nubia or Sudan until the 16th century. It takes them over a thousand years to penetrate. 
So this is another path of history that told, tells you there is something unique about, you know, the female principle within that particular region, which we now call modern day Sudan, of how it's not easy for foreigners to come in and to take over that territory. This is important here. Okay, so this is more the AD period. So this is a book called The Moors by Stanley Lane Poole, which goes into the history of black people who control Al-Andalus. There's a lot of misinformation of who the Moors were. The people that went into the Abiyan Peninsula were dark-skinned people. The Arabs at this time were dark. This is a historical fact. If you look at the likes of Ahmad ibn al-As, his mother was Cushitic Ethiopian, this is recorded, and his nephew, Okba ibn Nafir, he was also of Ethiopian extraction. So there's amalgamation that is taking place in the Arabian Peninsula, okay, with the people on the Red Sea. They have been trading for thousands and thousands of years. Okay, and then when they go into Egypt, when they go into Egypt and they spread into North Africa, and you've got the African black Berbers now not the white-skinned Berbers. They were a small, insignificant minority at the time. Okay, they were there, but they were a small minority. And if you read the song of Roland, when the Moors were fighting, uh, was it Charles Martel, etc., they described these Muslims as black as pitch with white clothes. Okay, these are Arabs and Africans at this particular time. Unfortunately, even that's being whitewashed, unfortunately. But we know where the word more come from. A more was a name which you would call a dark-skinned person. This is what it was, not a light-skinned person, a white person, okay? So this is just to show you the cover of who the Moors were. This was done by Stanley Lane Poole. It's a good book. There is some falsifications there because he has joined the Eurocentric perspective of trying to whitewash it. But there are elements within his book which shows you who the Moors were. Okay, and this time the Moors were Muslims. Okay, because the Moors before that were Christians. Okay, so we know we're talking about a people because the word Moor was used as early as 46 BC. This is six, six and a half to 700 years before the event of Islam. Okay, this is clear. So we know that the word was being used and they're talking about a particular people. And this era is the last walk in the sun for Daskian people. So Wayne B. Chandler found the Olmec, as I talked about in Mexico, okay, with the braids at the back. He was the one which found this in the drawer in the Smithsonian. He's a, he's a photojournalist, but he's also a historian. So when they were letting photojournalists in to look, Look at angel. So what Wayne B. Chandler says, he says, around 46 BC, the Romans uh, army enter West Africa. So it takes the Romans 100 years to get from North Africa to West Africa after the Third Punic Wars, when they defeated the Phoenicians or the Black Phoenicians in North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula. So he goes on to say, uh, West Africans, where they encountered Black Africans, who they called Maurice, from the Greek adjective Moros, meaning Black or Dark, okay? What I'm trying to emphasize, 46 BC. So the word Moor was used before the event of Islam. And we also know that there were Moors that was living in Britain, yeah, at an early stage. Some of them were Christians, some of them were Muslims. The evidence is out there, but this evidence is being suppressed because of what these people have created in the Iberian Peninsula for being there for almost 800 years. And this is why this information is being suppressed. So let's have a look at one different individual that comes out during this era. So we're going to look at the person by the name of Ali Ibn Afi, which is usually called Viryab or the Blackbird, because he sang, he had a beautiful voice. He was born into slavery in Mesopotamia and he was educated in Baghdad and he became a botanist. He was known as a Renaissance man before the Renaissance period. And in 822, he comes into Al Andalusia or Al Andalus, which was the name of Spain and Portugal. And this is where he's going to transform Iberian culture or Moorish culture or Islamic culture in the Iberian Peninsula. So you can see where education.
education for slaves was normal within the Islamic period. And this is quite unique. It was not like the chattel slavery. So when we look at slavery in its essence, we have to look at the element of upward mobility that certain people can have under this system and what and downward mobility it was in others, especially in Western Europe or within the West where um, development of black people are concerned, or rather the underdevelopment of black people are concerned. So slavery is different. You've got chattel slavery, you've got indention slavery, you've got domestic slavery. They're usually based on prisoners of wars, etc. if you understand history carefully. Okay, so this is what he brings to Europe, dress styles for four seasons. So Ziryab actually introduces into the Western world um, autumn, and spring. It was only winter and summer. So you have Moors or Daskian people influencing Western culture or European culture now. He also was the one that introduced the three course meal. And the three course meal consisted of a soup, an entree, a meat or the fish with vegetables and pasta, or would have been rice at that time because the Moors introduced rice into Europe. This is important here. Lemons, limes, citrus fruits they introduced into Europe. The, word, the, the name Portugal is supposed to come from the word portacal, portacal, which means oranges in Arabic, that these moors had brought in because the oranges grew fantastic in Portugal. So you've got Arabic words and African Arab, you've got, you've got African moors, you know, and Arab moors, who was in the Iberian Peninsula, developing it. So what it does, a soup, an entree, and then a dessert at the end. This is where it comes from. And this is what was used amongst the aristocracy in Europe. The other thing I want to emphasize as well about the three course meal is its importance in reducing waste. Because this is what Ziryab started to find. He started to see how in the Moorish courts, the amount of waste that was taking place. So this was a way of reducing waste to some degree because they was putting out these large amounts of food eating and a lot of food being thrown away. So it was a way of recycling and managing food. This is how he came up with this idea. Then he looked at hairstyles, use of crystal wear, okay? But these are the four things I wanted to understand. What you have in the Western world today was brought in either by black people, Africans, or Muslims. Toothpaste, soap, washing powder, and deodorant in its earliest stage was invented by this man here, Ziryab. If you read Stanley Lane's Pool's book, when he talks about Ziryab, he talks to Ziryab as a Persian, so he hides his identity. Because when you say Persian, you're looking at the Indo-European type. And this is what Stanley Lane Poole does. But he does talk about all these things in his book, The Story of the Moor, you know, within Spain, you know, because the, he, you know, because what is important here is that he is understanding what the Moors have brought, but he's trying to hide behind other ethnic groups or nationalities. But the Ziryab he talks about was Persian, because at the time he was born in Mesopotamia or Iraq, and that was part of the Persian Empire before the Battle of Cardassia, which the Arabs had defeated the Persians in. Okay, this is important here. So we're looking at AD history here. And this is what he uses to try to manipulate things, etc. But the emphasis here is toothpaste, soap, washing powder, and deodorant was introduced into Europe by the Moors as far as cleanliness and hygiene was concerned. Because those who know the different bubonic plays that took place during this period, it didn't touch the Iberian Peninsula at all. So let me just have a look at um, any messages for me. No, that's wonderful. I'll just carry on. Right, so the University of Salamanca. Now, what I want to emphasize here about the university is that the Moors had brought into Europe 17 universities and it was total social equality between the sexes. Women, Moorish women could be uh, professors, they can teach, they can learn alongside men. They didn't even allow this in Europe until the last maybe 100, 150 years. So this is important here. There was total social equality as far as developing, educating women was concerned. And if you read a book by um, George G.M. James, which is called Stolen Legacy, he says that the Moors, talking about West Africans, 
North Africans, black Africans he's talking about. When ancient Kemetic civilization fell, those people who had been educated in the University of Ipetisut, which was opened up about 2000 BC, okay? Africa is the first continent to have a university system. And then what happened was a lot of those students that worked or was educated in that university brought that knowledge back into places like Central Africa, West Africa, North Africa. And this knowledge was floating around for centuries. And when the Arabs come in, they were able to resurrect this knowledge and they bring it to the Iberian Peninsula. This is what these Africans did. So it is important for us to know the contribution, the achievements and accomplishments of dark skinned people before the enslavement period. And these were the, these were the disciplines or the sciences that they were teaching at this university. They were teaching from circular globes. But what I wanna emphasize here, this university complex was built by West Africans, not North Africans, West Africans. All the monuments like the Alhambra and all those buildings were built by black Africans, known as black Berbers. This is a historical fact. And in North Africa as well, they were built by those same people. We know this, but even that is being whitewashed, looking at the different groups of people who've amalgamated and then mixed in the North African region. And those monuments, those buildings with either latecomers, newcomers or interlopers. This is important here. So we are trying to claim back what we have created. It's literally been whitewashed by all different nationalities that has come in. And many books on North Africa, you read a book on North Africa, they've literally whitewashed out the black contribution, achievements and accomplishments from their area. And this is unfair. This is totally unfair, unrealistic. And the problem is within the Western world is that a lot of youngsters, even yourselves, will not read a book on black history or African history written by black people. I don't know why. This is, a, this is unfortunate, but this is the reality. And we have to change this paradigm. We have to change this narrative somehow. So when you look at what do these universities have in common? These universities have in common, they were all built or financed by women. Okay, all you know, financed by women. And these are all universities in Africa. So you've got the University of Timbuktu, which is in Mali, okay, which is known as the Sankore, okay. Then you've got these ones, Al Hazar and the Kerawin. Not Kerawan, should be Kerawin. This is in Fez, okay. These universities were financed. That was financed by a woman in Egypt, in Cairo. This one was literally financed and built by a woman, Fatima Al Fahri. They've tried to whitewash her as well, unfortunately, in North Africa. She was a dark skinned woman. And what has come out lately about the woman who's the founder of this university, which is over a thousand years old, okay? Over a thousand years old. This is the oldest, they say this is the oldest university in the world. It's the oldest university in the modern sense, because we know Ipetisut is much older, okay? And this is what happens. When they came in, they tried to deny the contribution that Africans made in the BC period. So this is more of the modern period that takes place within Fez, which is in Morocco. So the important thing here, when we talk about her, there's now evidence that's recently come out that the woman who built this university came from the Kunta tribe. The Kunta tribe is where Kunta Kinte got his name from, okay? He's supposed to be related to this particular woman and Okuba Ibn Afya. Kunta Kinte, the person which comes in roots, so this is some amalgamation which is taking place now. And people like myself and other scholars within this country, we are unearthing this reality now and bringing it back to where it is. Because there was a link between African Berbers, West Africans, which are known as Mauritanians, and the Arabs that came in. And now, that is literally why I think a woman built this, okay? An African woman, eh, financially, and another black African Arab woman, she's a mixture of the two, okay, built this. Two are all years before Europe even had a university, which was built by Europeans. This is important here. So we look at West Africa, because now we're gonna be coming slowly to the decline of African culture and African civilization. So here, this is my,
Most of you know, seen a few years ago, he was depicted to be the richest man that ever lived. Okay. The richest man that ever lived. Okay. And he had brought with him, he went on pilgrimage in 13, around about 1324 to Mecca, went through Egypt. He took so much gold with him, this man, he flooded the gold industry with literally within North Africa, within Egypt as well, and when he went to Mecca and Medina. And this is how, and he went with approximately between 60 to 70,000 followers. And this is the period now where the Europeans get ignited now with the riches in Africa because of what this man, Mansa Musa, did. The famous emperor of Mali, Mansa Musa, stopped in Timbuktu on his pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324. He went to uh, Regal Splendor, okay, with an entourage of 60,000 persons, including 1,200 slaves or servants, okay, 500 bondsmen, each of whom carried a staff of pure gold. Marched in front of it, marched in front of the emperor. 200, 280 camels for 2,400 pounds of this is this, this is wealth. This is wealth, which is in Africa. And now you know why the colonized colonial period came and why the enslavement period came and why West Africa was now being targeted. So this type of advertisement that Mansa Musa did, even though it was a grand gesture and it was appreciated by the connective lands within Africa, North Africa, you know, East Africa, which is in Egypt and Sudan, or which would be called Nubia, you know, and we go into the middle, what was now known as so-called Middle East, okay? They now know the riches and the wealth coming out of West Africa. And that's where a lot of the gold came from, to go into the Iberian Peninsula. And records are being shown this. In the British Museum, there is a coin with Isabella and Ferdinand, and the gold can be tra traced back to West Africa. This is, this, is in the Brit this is in the Welsh Museum. And I was teaching this a few months ago. So the gold that was coming into the Iberian Peninsula Europe was coming out of West Africa. They had so much gold deposits. And that's why the Europeans turned their attention to West Africa in the enslavement period so they can get their hands on this gold. There's Abu Bakr II. Now, what's important here, Abu Bakr II, this is an artist's impression of Abu Bakr II. Abu Bakr II was the brother of Mansa Musa, the richest man that ever lived. He was the sultan of this empire here, which is known as the Mali Empire. If you look at all those currents there, they all go into South America, Central America, the Caribbean Islands, etc., etc. This man had sent an expedition approximately. Um, 12, um, what do you call it, 1307 of 200 ships because he had a fascination about land being over the other side of the Atlantic. One ship came back and said a fierce wind or storm had taken those other ships and they came back to report it. He wasn't satisfied. He had commanded the construction of 2,000 vessels. He took people, food, gold, and all those things on the ships of 2,000 ships. He set sail and it left and he never returned back to Africa and he left Mansa Musa in charge and they actually found monuments of these Mandinka Muslims in the so-called Americas. This is also found in the book um, They Came Before Columbus by Ivan Van Sertima. These are the monuments which they found. So this is evidence to show you that the Africans had discovered so-called America two centuries before Columbus. Two centuries before Columbus. So here is a Mandinka head. You can see the, the turban, okay? You can see the West African tribal markings around the mouth, etc. This was being suppressed for, for generations. And there you can see it at the closer range. These are just some of them. Then you've got a Libyan script found in the Americas. What are the Libyans doing in America? This is amazing, a Libyan script. So you've got a Libyan script here. Then you've got the Arabic script. There's Arabic, Libyan, on this tree. I think it's a tree trunk. On this, on the, yeah, I think it's a tree trunk. 
or this might actually be a cave because they found different things in different places. Um, you will find this, Ivan Van Schurten was a linguist. He was the one which came across this information and another person by the name of Barry Fell. Get the books of Barry Fell. He writes two excellent books, Saga America, the book is called. This is where I got this from, Saga America. And he also talks of America BC. Okay, this is Barry Fell. You got, and there's a translation. Okay, so you got the Libyan script. You got an Arabic script, which is here. Okay, it is actually on the wall there, but you can barely see it because of the picture. Okay, so you got Muslim people, Libyan people, West African people, yeah, who were actually in the Americas before Columbus. This information was also suppressed. And what this basically says is plunge, in, uh, pl plunge into water and dissolve away impurity and troubles, okay? Is water for ritual ablution before devotion. This is wudu. Muslims know this is wudu. Why are Muslims talking about ritual purification, the washing before prayer? Because they must have been devout. This is what this means. So Muslims didn't just come to the so-called Americas since the Civil Rights Act was passed in the mid 1960s. We were in Americas even before that. This is evidence to show you that we were there even before that, centuries before. There's a closer look at it again. This is found in Barry Fell's book. And here is another Muslim. Okay, you can see this is a Muslim. This dates back, this was found in Peru. This dates back to 900 AD. Okay, so we didn't come to America as slaves. We came there way before that. And this is what I'm trying to emphasize and to substantiate with you by using pictorial evidence. If I would have told you this, those who didn't know and didn't show you these images, you wouldn't believe. Now you can go back and do your research and find out exactly looking at the African presence in early America before the enslavement period. So there you can see that's an African thick lips, you know, broad nose or nostrils, you know, and obviously you can see the topi or the tupi, depending on your translation, of a African Muslim. Then I'm, not, I'm just going to just flick through these, you know, the types of Sonny Ali, who was a great ruler of the Songhai Empire. Now, you know about the University of Timbuktu, yeah, he came from Jewish ethnicity, so you have a massive Jewish people living in West Africa. And what is coming out now, more and more people from America and the Caribbean are now embracing Judaism and realizing that their people were of a Jewish extraction in West Africa. Okay, so this is Sonny Ali. He was the last of the major rulers of the Songhai Empire before it fell. And he literally dies around about the time when Isabella and Ferdinand comes in. So what I'm trying to show you that West Africa at the time had cities, it had towns, it had massive trading routes. You know that the richest people in the Songhai Empire were the people who wrote books. You know, the gross national product of the Songhai Empire was books, even though they had massive salt and gold deposits. There's never been an empire yeah, which is based upon literature, knowledge, which was a gross national product of the country, ever. And this is why this information needs to come out, because they want to make us remain as slaves, we did nothing, and the white man came to civilize us. This is what this image uh, is telling us, if we understand those two major empires, the Mali Empire and the Songhai Empire. And then one of the last Muslim rulers of the Songhai Empire before it fell is Askia Muhammad. He goes on pilgrimage, not as uh, grandiose as Mansa Musa from the Mali Empire, but this is them making a commitment to Islam. You know, they're sharing their wealth, is opening up trade routes within West Africa, etc. And this is what the Europeans themselves want to get involved in. They're aware of this now. Okay, the picture which I showed you of Mansa Musa actually shows the depiction of this man with gold and how it ignited the passion of the people during the movement, you know, before the Renaissance or the Renaissance period and then the Enlightenment period, looking at West Africa was the land of gold. This is where the word Ghana comes from, which means gold. 
Okay, and now obviously there's going to be the Timbuktu, etc. Just reinforcing that when it came, it's still when the Empire of Songhai took over this, the Empire of Mali, they still maintained these buildings. Okay, so they didn't destroy buildings. Sometimes when people take over territories and regions in order to increase or to intensify or to expand their empire, they may usually destroy things. You no, know, they respected knowledge, they respected building. There was a sacredness to this. And then this is where things really start to fall. In 1591, West Africa was destroyed by Moroccan and Portugal mercenaries, okay? Because they wanted, because within Morocco, the Sultan of Morocco, he wanted the gold and salt deposits. In 1591, the Portuguese were given, they were given obviously Africa, and I will talk about that in the second session because I'm going to be rounding off now. And what happened was these Portuguese mercenaries were looking for slaves. So they amalgamated or confederated with the Sultan of Morocco, okay, for them to take over the Songhai Empire, which you can see here. That's the Songhai Empire here, okay? So they went into the University of Timbuktu, they destroyed the literature. That literature which they talk about, which has, been, which has been buried, it was buried around about this time, 1591, in Timbuktu, okay? It was at this time that they buried this literature. And they're amazed with what these West Africans had discovered, what type of explorations they were doing, and the type of knowledge they had at that particular time from this literature, which is now coming from underground and is being deciphered, they've been photographed because bookworms have taken um, have, have taken their aggression out on the pages, etc. So it was in it was in 1591 with the Moroccan led and a Portuguese mercenary command came in and destroyed the University of Timbuktu and Janay. It took his scholars basically into Marrakesh, okay, as slaves. But there was a particular person by the name of Ahmed Babla. Ahmed Babda was known as a scholar of scholars. And when he reached the city of Marrakesh, the people heard about his name, they had to release him. And the, because the people knew about his works, his works from in Timbuktu, he wrote over 40 books, was actually being transported and transferred into the northern sectors of Africa, which means they weren't just transferred in gold and salt, they were also transporting books and his books were most the most read most well read and understood literature they had to set this man free and basically what did they do he became a teacher of the major scholars in north africa this this african because when the university of timbuktu was at its height even arabs which was coming from the so-called middle east was going there they didn't have the knowledge like these people this is why it was so famed read phoenix the boys book you know, of the University of Timbuktu. I can't remember the name of the book by my head, but his name is Phoenix Du Bois, okay? And what I'm trying to emphasize here is looking at this was really the cataclysm which really intensifies slavery because security is now lost. This is now occupied by Morocco. And what is happening now is that Portuguese sailors are coming in and exploiting the prison of wars, which now they're going to take into slavery. Okay, so I think we'll have a break now and I continue with part two later. Thank you very much. So this next section now we're going to be looking at the the uh, the catastrophes now. Okay, we look at the catastrophe. So I showed you the last walk in the sun for black people, African people, you know, people are now, you know, coming into Africa now. They're taking out gold and silver as well as people as part of those resources into the so-called new worlds and while we're going to find ourselves into today's position. So, let's start to move. Okay, so basically, it is a chemitologist, educational psychologist, a historian. <clears throat> he says this There is something dreadfully wrong with an education socialization process that leaves us ignorant of our past, strange to our people, and apes of our oppressors. So we can look at this in two ways. Is Asa Iliad talking to black people or is he talking to all people? This is what's important here. And let me just break this down. When he's talking about education socialization, he's talking about the educational system. If the educational system don't teach you about your past, 
you're going to be ignorant about what your people done or what your people did. And if you're not socialized within your homes, which is always your primary socialization, if you are not socializing your homes about your people and their past, you're going to be ignorant. Because the whole point of history is about memory. This is what's important about history, it's about memory. History, unfortunately, is taught in a very, you know, negative way to some extent. It looks at dates and facts and dates and facts. And youth, youngsters, adults find it very boring. But the whole point of history is to tease out, bring out the nuances of past generations, the nuances of past cultures, past civilizations, and look at where we are today. Because we're only where we are today because of what happened yesterday. So the past is intrinsically linked with the present, as well as being intrinsically linked with the future. So the past only happened moments in our minds. A lot of people say, well, it happened a long time ago, so we should forget about it. This is not the African tradition of understanding history. This is not yet, this is not, because they would not have recorded all those ancient records if it was useless. Okay, this is important here. This may be the tradition which is said in many countries in Western Europe, but overall, if we look at the African understanding to education, knowledge and history, it's about understanding where we are today, what mistakes we did yesterday, so we do not repeat those mistakes. So this is what's important. So let's have a look, you know, education, educational system, socialization, what are we being taught at home or what are we teaching at home? Okay, this process leaves us ignorant of our past, strangers to our people, ace of our oppressors is how we were seen in the eyes of Europeans from this particular period. So in this particular session here, I'm gonna be looking at these different things here. And this is gonna be amalgamated in my presentation. I'm not gonna talk them outright, but you're gonna see these things merging within different slides. You're gonna see imperialism, colonization, colonialism, racial discrimination, and integration. This is what all these things are going to, going to take place and amalgamate within my presentation. So 1492 comes, okay? Well, Abdel, the last Moorish ruler, okay, surrenders the city of Granada to Ferdinand and Isabella, okay? This was the same year that Christopher Columbus decides to take money from Isabella to so-called explore the new worlds because he's walking around with maps. These maps that Columbus is walking around were drawn by Moors. So we know, I just told you the Libyan script. We know that Muslims and Moors were in the Americas. That's the only way you can draw those maps. So when he was talking, he was going to travel west to get to the east. Okay, he wasn't too sure about the islands, which he didn't think there was any land there, to tell the truth. He knew about the Great Khan of India, and that's what he was going to go into sea, etc. Because there was a lot of because the spice trade was coming into the Iberian Peninsula along with the Moors, because there was a Muslim state within India. And a lot of those people were coming into the Iberian Peninsula, into North Africa, mixing with the people as well as trading. So Columbus is well aware of all this information, okay? So he's walking around with maps which wasn't drawn by the people of the North. This was drawn by Moors, Moorish cartographers, Muslim cartographers. That's who was drawing these maps, okay? So this is what happened. So in 1492, the Moors fall. And they were in Spain for approximately 781 years, from 711 to 1492. And what the Moors have produced in Spain and Portugal has never been seen ever since with civilization, building structures, scientific inquiry, exploration, university complexes, mansion houses, manors, yeah, um, a sewage system, roads, pavements. These are the things that the Moors had created. There was no pavement, streetlights, etc. All these things are not necessarily in Europe at this time, even though the Romans built roads, etc., not to the extent in which the Moors had created in the Iberian Peninsula. This is important here, okay? This is really important here. So we're looking at a civilization that has now fallen or come to an end. 
So after that particular period, Spain and Portugal becomes the two superpowers of the world. Spain and Portugal, as you can see there, you've got Spain there, Portugal there. Okay, they're fighting one another. So between 1493 and 1494, the Pope decides to intervene in his two Catholic nations dispute. Because now they're looking at land, because they know about the exploits of Mansa Musa, Sonny Ali. They knew the gold which was coming out of North Africa and the food supply that was coming into Europe from Africa into the Iberian Peninsula, which flooded into Europe, such as asparagus, rice, oranges, lemons, limes, and the list just goes on. The list just goes on with the amount of food supplies that was coming in, as well as precious stones such as rubies and emeralds, gold that was coming out, silver was coming out, iron, copper, bronze, and the list just goes on that was coming out of Africa into that region. And this is what they want to exploit. So here you've got two lines here. So you've got Pope Alexander, who comes into dispute because they're fighting and squabbling over the lands, because Portuguese have been making discoveries as early as the 1440s. And the Spanish are now making discoveries in the latter part of the 1400s, the 1490s. The Spanish start to go out and they start seeing things. So they come into conflict with one another. So the Pope decides to split the world into two. He gives half the world to Portugal and half the world to Spain. This is what he does. He's the most powerfulest individual or man in the whole of Europe, this Pope. And his two little babies is Portugal and Spain. So if you look at this line here, this is the first line which was drawn in 1493. But when Columbus comes back, because remember, Columbus is secretly working for the Portuguese, okay? Even though he's using uh, Spanish wealth or money, which is basically stolen from the Moors, but the money that comes out of Ferdinand and Isabella is now given to Columbus to go on his excursions or his explorations or his so-called discoveries, okay? So what happens now, Columbus is aware of Brazil, okay? But what he basically says to the Spanish, okay, that this was a water mass, okay? It wasn't a land mass, it was a water mass. This is what he was saying, okay? So what happened was that the Pope later on in 1494 decides to move the line even further into Brazil. And this is why Brazil speaks Portuguese today. This fell, into the, this, this fell into the Portuguese realm. Portugal was given Brazil, Africa, Asia. So before the Dutch went into India and, and China and, all, and Malaysia, it was the Portuguese which were there before for about 200 years. This is important here. They were the two main superpowers at that time, okay? They were equivalent to America or China or America or Russia, whatever you want to say. That's who Spain and Portugal were at that time. They had, they had hegemony as a result of the Pope over the world at this time. So this is what happened. So they went back and argued at the summit, and that's how the lines were moved. So Spain was given the others now. So beyond this line here, Spain was given all these lands here, which is South America, Central America, North America, South America, Alaska, Canada, that was all given to Spain. This is why a lot of these places are Spanish speaking today. And that takes place around about 1493, 1494. So I'm just setting the stage now. So Africa now belongs to the Portuguese, which means Spain, which got all this land now, is gonna need a slave labor, but they can't go into Africa. So they are actually exporting white prisoners of wars to the so-called colonies but the colonies which they focus on are the small caribbean islands because these lands were huge we know about the conquistadores going into central uh, america and south america etc but they were wanted to produce minerals commodities resources etc from this but they couldn't get a cheap slave labor from africa because africa belonged to the portuguese I've read books where they say that Spain was going into Portugal. This was a violation of the treaty. This didn't happen. It happened later on, but not in the early stages. So let's have a look at the Asiento. Now, the Asiento de Negros, which came around about 1591, was permission to sell slaves. Now, why in 1591? What happened three years before that? That was when the Portuguese mercenaries 
and the Moroccans had destroyed the University of Timbuktu. Okay, they destroyed the University, the Songhai Empire, University of Timbuktu. They started to exploit the gold and salt deposits, etc. While the Portuguese was exploiting the human cargoes, became slaves. So it's amazing how three years later, 1591 was the destruction of West Africa. 1594 was the Asiento. The Asiento de Negros was basically permission to sell slaves. But Spanish needed them because they needed to develop the so-called new world. Okay, so Charles V commissions other nations, yeah, for, um, for slaves, and it's between 4,000 to 15,000 slaves which was deported um, to the so-called SPAT, to Spain, and then they were taken from Spain then to the so-called New World. This is what's important here. So slavery really starts about 1517, really and truly. Okay, we know there was a lot of white indentured and slaves which were in dungeons, we know about the Inquisition, etc. You know, but that seems to be glossed over. They seem to focus on those slaves who were coming out of Africa. But they didn't come until just before the 1600s. This is important here. Okay, the first slaves that went over were from Spain. I'm a descendant of those slaves, okay? We were Moors, we were living in Spain. When Columbus brought many of us over, etc., they referred to us as Maroons. We moved from the word more to Moresco to Maroons. We went to the mountains of places like Jamaica. We settled there and the Spanish couldn't enslave us. I'm a descendant of those people. I can trace my lineage back to Spain, to Andalusia, I'm a Moor. Well, we call us Maroons. Maroons comes from the word semarone or semarones, which means wild or untamed. In order to associate with horses because after, after, 49, after the 1490s, these people refused to capitulate to Catholicism. They still wanted to hold on to their belief. Um, they were still fighting for freedom and they expected Ferdinand and Isabella to respect the treaty that they signed with Bo Abdil or Abu Abdullah in 1492. This is what this is about, okay? The Songhai Empire, which I've got there, was destroyed in 1591. So now you can see how they're able to exploit West Africa because of the security now being lost in West Africa. Okay, so it goes on to say about contracts and licenses that the Spanish was offering out to other nations. So they're offering, uh, they're offering licenses to Portugal first because Portugal owns Africa according to the Treaty of Tordesillas. Then Britain, France, Holland, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, and Italy comes in with contracts coming which is committed to the Pope or by the Spanish monarchy to take slaves from West Africa. And this is how it comes about. And then later on, when they started to see the riches, they started to tear away the, the Spanish and the Portuguese empire. So if you look at Spain, for instance, Spain had America, um, North America, the Dutch had taken that off called, you know, New York was, was, was called New Amsterdam, was taken by the Dutch in the 1600s. The Dutch also took in the 1640s, Brazil, from the Portuguese. Britain came in and they took the southern parts of the state, which later became known as Virginia. It was called Jamestown. Now you can see where the other nations are coming in to take away those uh, exploits from the Spanish and the Portuguese. The French Quarter is, is areas which is known as Mississippi and Louisiana. Okay, is known as the French Quarter. So now you can see where the Asiento, the Asiento de Negros, permission or licenses to sell Negroes. We're no longer called Moors now, we're called Negroes. And this is what develops our downfall at this particular time now. Okay, other nations fight the system. So what happened is now they're all fighting. Sp the Portuguese are fighting the Dutch. The Spanish are fighting the British. Then obviously the French comes in later on. The Spanish are fighting the French and the British and the Dutch. And they were fighting and squabbling amongst each other and fighting one another. And this is where the concept of race comes out. The concept of race was when these European nations were racing down the Atlantic to develop it. And what they noticed was when they were going into these different areas in the so-called Caribbean islands, in Central America, in North America, in South America, in Asia, they started to notice that the skin color of the people were different. So they didn't realize that there was, a, they actually thought there was more white people beyond Europe. This is what was believed at the time. So what they started doing, they started to put the word race 
not by them racing down, which comes from the, from the essence of competition. The word race was now put on the five color classification of people around the globe, which is black, white, yellow, red, and brown people, with the white people not being at the top. This is how race was constructed in the 1600s. So you now understand where the concept of race literally comes from. Okay, racing down to develop is about economics, is about trade and commerce, commercial enterprising, resources, minerals, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so England, Britain only comes in around about the early 1600s. This is important here. So now we're going to look at the British Empire, and there you can see how huge the British Empire was within the roundabout up until the 1800s. Okay, up until the 1800s, this is how large the British Empire was. Some say it's one third of the world, some say it's one quarter, whatever the case may be, but it was a large empire. And you can find why there's a lot of people who speak the English language, literally because of the hegemony, the control, the authority that the English had to consolidate land in this country. They had to take parts of Scotland off the Scots and they had to take parts of Wales off the Welsh. They had to consolidate. They became part of the British Empire, the Commonwealth. And then later on, Northern Ireland was taken, okay, which gave us a concept of Great Britain. That's what caused Great Britain when Northern Ireland was taken, and so on and so forth. And then they started to go into, because they were, they were beggars, really. And truly, if you look at it at the early stages, they were looking for resources and minerals and commodities to come in in order to, to, to enrich themselves. Okay, they were going to India, trying to get into the spice trade. Yeah, they were trying to go over here to get involved with the cotton trade, etc., and sugar in the Caribbean islands, so on and so forth. So let's have a look at the Elizabethan period and bring this up to the modern context of why, we, why we're in the situation we're in today. So in 1555, the English Queendom began to take interest into the New World voyages and explorations because she was hearing news of the Spanish exploits, the Portuguese exploits in this land. And at that time, Britain was really and truly poor. There's a reference there if you want it, you know, uh, culture and consumption by Grant McCracken. Now, in 1580, Britain responded. This is how early Britain comes into it now, because they were sending so-called privateers, buccaneers, explorers out in order to steal from the Spanish. You know, this is why the Armada comes into existence, because her pirates were stealing from Spanish ships. And this is when the Armada, Spanish Armada, came to Britain to try to destroy Britain. But it didn't, it wasn't successful. In, 15, in 1580, Britain responded with the principles of effective occupation. And this comes out to the Elizabethan period. And what that meant, if British pirates, privateers, buccaneers, explorers saw land that belonged to the Spanish and the Portuguese, and the people were known to be infidels on those lands, they should take it and that should be part of the English kingdom, which would now become part of the British Empire. This is where it begins, okay? And you'll find a lot of this information. Eric Williams, this book was written in 1944 called Capitalism and Slavery. And what Eric Williams is trying to say that there was no capitalism unless the slave trade was in effect. This is true, we know this. And if I get time, I will explain some proofs to substantiate this, you know? So slavery was a precursor to capitalism, okay? This is what needs to be understood. In 1601, Queen Elizabeth I issued a proclamation saying that Negroes and Blackamoors, okay, Negroes and Blackamoors, okay, now we've gone into 1600, so the name changed. They're no longer Moors, they now call them Blackamoors, meaning black as a Moor. It's like saying white as snow, okay? They were living in Britain. A lot of them were coming out of North Africa, Mauritania. They were living in many of the Celtic villages in Ireland, yeah, uh, County Cork and they were living in places in England. We know this, this information is being suppressed. There was black people living during the Elizabethan period and the Stuart period in Britain at this time who were very upwardly mobile, okay, and integrated within Western or British society. Her proclamation is saying that Negroes and Blackamoors should be deported from England because they were infidels, meaning Muslim. That's what they called Muslims at that time. After the Spanish Inquisition, and England now falls into Protestantism, 
okay? Because Charles, not Charles, uh, her father, Henry VIII, okay, he decided to abdicate, you know, from the Catholic Church, and he wanted to become the head of the Church of England, which is the Anglican Church now, etc. And Protestantism comes into being. And we know those of you from religious backgrounds would know that the Protestant Reformation begins in 1517. It was the same time that Charles V is, send, is asking yeah, for slaves to come into the Spanish Empire so they can build things within the so-called Americas. 1517, Martin Luther, yeah, the Protestant Reformation, and it becomes a counter-reformation for the Catholics. So the other thing I want to emphasize here as well, that not only are the black and and Negroes living in Britain in the 1600s, infidels, which means Muslims, a lot of them were black Christians as well. And many of them would have been from the orthodox yeah, uh, perspective, or they would have been Catholics. That this is important to know. So she was trying to rid them out. So it wasn't just Muslims, it was people of color. This is what needs to be clear. Because when we read many of the history books, what took place at that time, Christians as well as Muslims have been kicked out. So when we look at Islamophobia, it's much older than 9-11. And it's unfortunate that people don't know this, that Muslims were living here, what, three, four, five hundred years ago. We got historical documentation to show you that Muslims have been living in Britain, in places like England and Ireland and Scotland, as early as the 10th century. So Muslims have been living here for over a thousand years. This is historically documented. The information is out there, but it's being suppressed. So it goes on to say, okay, because they were contributing to the economic and social problems. So people have been a, a scapegoating now. There was, they, they were used as scapegoats, these dark skinned people. Just like scapegoating with the Irish, you know, being terrorists, now it's supposed to be Muslims, terrorists. This is a historical game that has always been played in Britain. This is nothing new. Nothing new is under the sun. Okay? And this is why we need to history because we will see those interconnections with the past, with the present where they say that nothing has changed and for, to a large extent, very little has changed. Then you've got the signs, the likes of John Hawkins. He creates a ship known as uh, the ship, ship Jesus Christ. This is what the ship, the slave ship was called, okay? He went to the so-called Americas, etc., and he is known as Sir John Hawkins. Sir, because he ended up trading in slaves, and he ended up bringing th things back to Britain in order to please his queen. So these are like your privateers, your buccaneers, and all these other sorts of individuals. And you can see how he's exploiting the, the, the mainlands of West Africa, obviously because the Spanish, have lo uh, Spanish are slowly losing control, and so are the Portuguese. So you've got slaves now going into the Middle Passage, etc. So this is just showing you the, what is taking place in the early 1600s, okay? From, from early as the 1550s, right up into the early 1600s. And there you've got images of propaganda, which is showing you, even though a lot of African slaves were forced to strip naked and to come over you naked to give the impression that they were savage and barbarians, they're not literally chained up necessarily. You know, you can see where there's a bit of freedom of movement. This was propaganda in order to stop the abolition movement from progressing. That's all it was, to try to make out that these darkies which were coming over into the Western world, such as the Caribbean islands, North America, Britain, France, and Spain, and Portugal, and all these other European countries are brought in, 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 in good condition. And this is, was just not true. Then we start to see during the Stuart period, on the left-hand side, you've got the likes of King James, okay? And then you've got his son and grandson, Charles I and Charles II. So now we're going into the 1600s. And this is when you now start to see where the Caribbean islands start to come into the realm of the British. So St. Kitts is found during King James's period in 1623. So I'm trying to give you all these historical links with the UK, with the Caribbean islands, with black people, okay, which is over 400 year relationship, even longer than that, okay? Barbados was, take, uh, was taken in 1627. So it's under these individuals, we start to see where the Spanish islands are now being taken away by the British, okay? Or by the English, monarchies. So that's who the slave, who's, who's running the slave trade in Britain, was the monarchy, 
okay? And then the aristocrats were your people who were either your merchants or your men of profession or your planters, which were being sent over to, cult to help cultivate this land, to bring those resources, minerals and commodities back into Britain. So this is a steward period. So why is this not in the history books? And if it is in the history books, why are it not being taught? You know, you would think, you know, people didn't even know, most of you probably didn't even know there wasn't black, there was black people in the 1600s in this country. You were free, wasn't slaves, you were free. Very upwardly mobile. And there's more literature. I bought two books in the last year, which looks at the steward and steward the period by white scholars, a female and a male, who is looking at that particular period, showing the African or the black presence in Britain before the intensification of the transatlantic slave trade. So let's have a look at Britain now. So in, 1660, in 1606, okay, this is during the period of the Stuarts, you know, Queen Elizabeth uh, has died on about this time. And then you get two major companies. And this is the beginning of multinational and transnational corporations now. Okay, so you've got the London Adventurers, okay, Adventures of the City of London, or the Adventure City of London. Sometimes they were called the London Company or the London Adventurers. Okay. And then you had the Plymouth, then you had the Plymouth Merchants or the Plymouth Company. So there were two main companies. One was dealing with slaves. The other one was dealing with commodities and bringing back Welsh, Scottish and English subjects as indentured laborers in the Caribbean islands or in the Americas. So they would just come out of a feudal system and they're enslaving their own people. We know that in 1560, yeah, the feudal system came into Britain, which meant that the land that a lot of these peasant farmers were working on, yeah, now became private property because there was a massive trade that was needed in the world, especially with sheepskin and um, wool. So the it was for the pasture of sheep. This is what this, the enclosure movement was, was for. So they started to privatize land. And when these peasant farmers went back on the land, okay, in order to feed their families with apples or whatever the case may be, they were called as criminals. Sometimes the person who was responsible was, was jailed or put in a dungeon or the whole family was. Those people was in the dungeons now were now being sent to the so-called Americans. This is important now because there's this thing where they don't even want to acknowledge the white slave trade. There was a thing called the white slave trade that existed even before the transatlantic slave trade. You know, selling women from a lot of these ports of Merthyr Tidwell and Swansea, you know, London and Bristol, you know, and all these other places, Liverpool and Edinburgh and Glasgow was being sent over to the Americas to create so-called whorehouses. This is where it came from. We watched these cowboy movies, but don't realize that these, where these English speaking women came from. They're being pimped out. And now they now, now with the modern uh, sex slave trade today, they're now making these links as if these links were never there before. And the amount which is being sold in North Africa as well, and many of them were being sent there because now they're finding many of the North Africans got the DNA of people who live in places like uh, Bath, um, Swansea, Merthyr <laughs> Tidville. So this is where some of those ships had sailed into. They were maybe blown into those areas. And there was massive amount of white slave markets in North Africa that black Moorish men were responsible for. This is a part of history that no one likes to talk about for some reason, where black men were selling white people prior to this time or at the same time. So slave owners weren't just white people. They were dark skinned people which were selling slaves because it was a market. It was, a, it was an economy. Then we're going to be looking at Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan was from Wales, okay? He came from the areas of Llan Rumney and, 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 and Rumney and Llan Rumney, okay? He's a Welshman. He was supposed to be believed to be born in Monmouthshire, etc. This is Jamaican rum, which he produced in Jamaica. He became the lieutenant governor. This is during the time of Charles II, which is known in British history as the Restoration Period, because Oliver Cromwell, after he executed the father, Charles I, okay? Oliver Cromwell, during his time, Britain was a republic at this time. There was no more monarchy, it was a republic. And then after the death of Oliver Cromwell, there was what was known as a restoration period. Charles II was restored as monarchy in England and it carried on. 
And this is, this, it was during this time that Henry Morgan comes on the scene. Henry, Henry Morgan is a Welshman, okay? This is the house that he lived in, in Shadig House, which is in Newport, okay? So what I'm trying to do is marry in different, you know, history from Britain with the so-called New World. So this is just a bit of information here. Uh, the only thing I want to emphasize here is that the Morgan was one of the richest of the Welsh families. They owned over 90,000 acres of lands, over 90, Newport Road and all that was owned by the Morgans. Clan Rumney, Rumney, most of Newport, right up into Monmouthshire, yeah? It was an extensive amount of land that the, this family has actually owned, okay? So I think it's important to put this into perspective and not just that, showing the links with Wales and the Caribbean islands, okay? Henry Morgan was from Wales. He was a lieutenant governor of Jamaica. He had a plantation in Jamaica, which he called the Tran Rumney Plantation. He had over 100 slaves, okay? This is important here. Henry Morgan was a pirate. He was stealing off Spanish ships and causing problems for the British monarchy or the Stuarts. He was causing problems for them. He was asked to come back to Britain and to stand trial. When he came back, they saw his loot. They decided to change their minds and then they knighted him. And that's how he became Sir Henry Morgan. And all these people who were known as sirs were all slave traders and slave owners and slave merchants to some degree. Okay, Sir Francis Drake. Sir Henry Morgan, Sir Walter Raleigh. And the list just goes on. Any person with the name Sir uh, tied into slavery, um, enslaving people, looking at merchandise for coming from the Americas or the Caribbean islands, that's what they did. And that's how he got off with it. And then he was made Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica. And the atrocities that this man did in Jamaica is unbelievable. Literally, there's a part, part, there's a part of Jamaica called Port Royal. And it was just full of prostitutes. He, of the amount of mixed race or mulatto women and African women and Taino women that were exploited of having men coming in and having their way with these women, impregnating them and on all this other type of thing was actually commissioned by Henry Morgan, known by the stewards. They were the ones who were controlling the land because as soon as they had land over in the Caribbean islands, it now belonged to the monarchy. So you've got to understand that the monarchy was intrinsically involved with enslavement. And it, it, it even includes the royal family even till today. Okay? They, uh, they, got the, they got the dirty hands of their involvement in slavery. History tries to push them away. But you can't. You cannot push it away because it's too intrinsically involved. And then involvement with colonization, which I'll talk about next week in Africa, and the minerals and commodities and resources that was coming out of Africa, a lot of those profits flowed into their direction. This is what is, this is the truth. And this is what it's all about. Oh, and just before I go, um, I think, and I believe, because they, are, they used to like to name names after where they came from. I believe that the word rum is actually associated with Rumney and Slan Rumney. Okay, his plantation was called the Slan Rumney Plantation after Slan Rumney. Okay, so what I'm showing you now that there's words, there's Welsh words in the Jamaican geography. You'll find similar things in Barbados and Trinidad and St. Kitts and St. Lucia and Grenada and all these other English speaking Caribbean within the landscape. So let's have a look at race here. I'm not going to read through all this, but all I want to show you from the 1700s onwards, they wanted to classify people based upon their racial composition. Okay, so you've got Homo um, Americanus, Homo Europeanus, this is Leonaeus now, Homo Asiaticus, and Homo Hafa. And all I want to focus on here is to have a look at the Homo Hafa, what they try to make people believe as black. Dogmatic, cunning, lazy, lustful, careless, and governed by caprice. In other words, no control over their desires, their emotions, their mindset, etc. But what I want to point your mind to is this lazy. How can it be lazy when they were making so much money? Because when this was written by Leonaeus, this was written when Britain and other European nations were intrinsically involved in the exploitation of human cargo and enslavement. And they made a lot of money because a lot of merchants became rich, not through working the land, 
okay, through selling land and then receiving those revenues or financial benefits. So how can they be lazy? Then they say less so. And this was believed. You, many of you saw the film 12 Years a Slave, and there's a prime example where the black woman, the slave, is being perpetually raped. And the wife, knowing this is taking place, is referring to the, this woman as being lustful after the husband, like she wanted the husband anyway, and blaming her. So she's being sexually abused by the, by, the, by the husband, yeah, and physically abused by the wife. This is exactly what happened in the Caribbean islands as well. Same thing. And this is what they were saying, we are lustful. And we had long, elongated, you know what. These are the things that came out in the 1700s. Okay, so I'm trying to place where they're trying to de demonize to actually develop an understanding about who these Daskian people were. And then later on, you got the likes of Blumenbach. So Leonaeus looks at people through skin color, okay? Four races on the planet through skin color. He adds, and this is where the concept of Caucasian comes into being, okay? And Malayan classification comes into the equation. So when we look at Caucasian, we know it was Blumenbach. So when people talk, talk about themselves being Caucasian, they're literally talking about what? They're talking about themselves being white or whatever the case may be, okay? Pure, whatever. Because look at the attributes he gives to Caucasians in relation to those so-called Ethiopians. Ethiopian means burnt face or dark face people, not people from Ethiopia. So any black person, whether inside or outside Africa, because that's what it was, because they would have spoke Latin at that time, you know, they would have spoke elements of Greek at that time. So they would have used Greek terminologies in order to describe the people. So that's why Ethiopian is on there. So this is how it was stratified in the Americas um, at that time. So the first three, are the most important. You've got your planters, you, then you've got your merchant class, and then you've got your men of profession. So these are your hierarchical structures of white people within the Americas. This includes the Caribbean islands as well. So the planter was the more influential person. They worked directly with the monarchy in Britain, okay? So they were the ones which were controlling the land. Some of them didn't own the land. Those that, that land belonged to the king and queen, depending on who was head of the monarchy. The land in the Caribbean islands and the land in America. This is why when you get the early immigrants of Puritans going to America and settling in America, they called it Jamestown after King James, and they called it the state of Virginia after Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. So this is how they put their name on things. So it's clear that the monarchy was involved with this. This is what this is about. So you've got the planters. Then you've got the men of profession. They are the ones that deal with import and export. Yeah, they're looking at the resources and the minerals that are coming from the land, helping in the transportation of those things to be sold either in Britain or all around the world. And that's who Colston was. The person who was thrown in the harbor in Bristol a few months ago was a merchant. But what they don't tell you that he was even trading white indentured enslaved people as well. I'm sure if people knew that they wouldn't be, there wouldn't be an outcry with him being pulled down and for him to be erected in some other place. The man, this is the atrocities that this man had done to both black and white people. Okay, Picton, when he was taken out of the uh, city hall, etc., he was a planter. Okay. These are the people which are revered in British society. And this is supposed to be amongst British best. If this is your best, who's your worst? And we know what he did with um, a particular girl. I can't remember her name now um, from, the top of the top, from the top of my head, but he, he raped her perpetually, he even tortured her, okay? And it was a case against him and he literally got off with it. These men literally could get away with murder. And then you had the men of profession, who were your educated class. They were more educated from the men of profession than any other group. So you got your government officials, your clergymen, lawyers, doctors, etc., etc. The vast majority of white people that went were your convict class, okay? Your convict class. This is what they were. And they fell into two categories. They were known as your subordinate whites. They had a little bit of education, so they were the ones with your bookkeepers, your overseers on plantations, your managers, your accountants, etc. 
So they were very much less, but they were sometimes were lads to a small degree indentured. So they were slaves themselves on the plantation to some degree. This never really comes out in films. And this is what I mean, movies are distorting. Many books are not telling us these stories. So we have to look further ahead of what these things actually are. And then you've got your white bond servants, who's your criminal class, your political prisoners. A lot of those are your Irish. When Britain was taking over Ireland at the time, many of them went to places like Jamaica and Trinidad and Barbados. I don't know why this is not in the history books, you know, and the Irish are treated like dirt. They were treated disgusting in the Caribbean islands as early as the 1600s, you know, as early as the 1600s, you know, and obviously going to the Americas as well, you know, because many people, many of them will have you believe that the Irish population only ended up going to America after the potato famine, okay? No, more of them went before the potato famine, okay, to the Americas, to the Caribbean islands, okay, to Canada. Alaska and all these other places. Many of them had even settled in Central America as well. You know, a lot of them were sent there when Britain had gained hegemony over some of those territories until they lost it to the Spanish. But this is what I'm trying to emphasize here. Then this is how black community was stratified. Okay, so you had the colored people, which were your mixed race progeny. Your mixed race progeny were known as coloreds at the time, or they usually referred to as mulattoes. Okay, then you had your free blacks. These are people who were manumitted. They bought their freedom. And then the slaves fell into four categories. Your mechanics, your domestic servants, your headmen, and your field hands and your boiling hands. Again, what is distorted on movies? When they look at this classification, they almost always focus on the field hands. But they were a the minority. The vast majority of the people that worked in the Americas as slaves were your skilled class, which was your mechanics, your carpenters, your handymen, the people who built, you know, who, your tailors, your shoemakers. Where do you think all these clothes came from? These gowns and things. Who do you think was making them? You know, later the French got involved. Okay, but these clothes were being made by African slaves, a mass producing this stuff not necessarily in places like France and Spain, were making these clothes. So we got to look at the bigger picture. They were the backbone of the American society, the Caribbean society, the mechanics. They were the ones who were to the builders, okay? They were the ones, all those chairs, who used to create the chairs and those dining tables, okay? And the crystal ware, which was coming in, you know? And the glass, and the cups, who do you think was creating this? There was a market taking place. It was made by slave labor, slave labor. This is what it was made by, but they will have you believe in all they did was pick cotton, yeah? And all they did was pick sugar or cut down sugar, molasses and all these other type of things. These are lies. We need to go further than that and wider than that. And all I'm giving you is a classification of how slaves were constructed by the British in this case, in the Caribbean islands and in North America. Domestic servants could either be men and women. And so what I'm trying to emphasize here that women were in full-time employment. Their black community was a do working household. That's only become recent in Britain in the last 30 years. Before that, it was a nuclear family, which was based upon one breadwinner, the male breadwinner while there was a stay-at-home mum. That has never existed for black people in five centuries. So let's go back and read history, read carefully and to know that there was a system for whites, system for blacks, even in our family structures, and who was the earner. So this is important here. So men and women could be domestic servants and obviously maids and cleaners and nannies, etc. But obviously what's missing from there are comfort girls, young girls who were taken by slave owners or men of the profession or planters um, to gratify themselves. This was a horrific system that took place at that time. Then you had the headmen, which were usually referred to as your sellouts to some extent, because it was a privileged role. They would ride carts, they were the head of this and that, and they report back to the slave owner. Some of them then were that we were advantageous in some cases because under those sort of conditions, 
we started to see where the headmen will report some of the conversations that these whites were having on how they're going to treat us and how they're going to change the economy or what was taking place. And they actually helped in slave rebellions to a large extent, but there were many sellouts amongst them. And then obviously the ones that you're all aware of, which they always like to plaster during Black History Month, because we didn't do anything in history except to enslave or work for white people, unfortunately, which is not true, is the field hands and sugar boilers. Okay, and they were this was the hardest and the intensive work. This is where the whippings and the beatings would take place to these people for not working hard enough because there were certain yields they needed to accumulate in order to send to Britain, whether it was cotton or whether it was sugar or molasses or potato, whatever the case may be. So that's the end. So I hope that I've gone through that. I hope I've um, solidified all that information give you an aspect of what catastrophic meant as us as a people. And by next week, hopefully, what I'll end up doing is looking a bit more into the slave system, the, the rebellions, we look at parliament and we will look at Congress, et cetera, and what type of changes they wanted to make to abolish slavery or the slave trade or a slave system and the type of regulative measures they were bringing into existence in order to let, allow us to integrate slowly into Western society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abu, for another, Abu Bakir, for another fascinating lecture. Um, we've only got two questions, so I'll ask you them both together. Okay, thank you. Um, Ian, Julie says, you have got such an extensive knowledge from the years of research. What one or two books would you put on your essential reading list for students or staff to start building their knowledge of black history. And their next one is, are schools and curriculum designers taking it seriously that history has been completely distorted to exclude the BAME voices and stories? And how are you seeing things changing as I know you are feeding into these discussions? Okay, just hold on one sec. Let me just go and get my collection of books. Right. So there's a few books, I think. There's no one book, etc. But if we're looking at the Moorish period, say for instance, I can see this book is pretty good. Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Ivan Van Sertima. I got a lot of my information from this. And this looks at high culture of black people during the Moorish period. So we're looking at the Carthaginian period. We're looking at the time of the Romans, etc. And how Dask, you know, black people live amongst other groups of people at that particular time. Okay, so this is a pretty much a good book. Um, the Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams is another good book. And I know they got these books at Cardiff University. When I was teaching there, they actually brought those books in. So they are in the libraries. I can't remember the numbers, but they are in the libraries. This book is there. This is another book which is there at Cardiff University Libraries, okay? Destruction of Black Civilization, okay? And that made, was my main focus for this particular presentation, okay? That was my main focus for this particular presentation. Um, the Golden Trade of the Moors, which is good. It looks at the economic building and construction of African cultures and civilizations before European slavery. This is important. So it looks at Africa trading with Europe during the Roman times, the Greek times, etc. Okay, and the interconnected relationships with other African nations, not just in West Africa, but in Central, North, East, and South. And the other book which I mentioned about the findings of African presence in um, the Americas is called Saga America. Okay, Saga America, Barry Fell. That's what I got my information from, looking at the scripts which was written in Central America and some of the faces which have been seen as well of African people. And further about the American presence, the African presence in early America, there's two, an early America Revisited, are both edited books by Ivan Van Sertema with a collection of different 
um, authors writing essays, different scholars writing essays, looking at different aspects from a linguistic perspective or cultural perspective or the trade, whatever the case may be. So you have these two books here. Okay, uh, so that's basically it. But what I would say to you, if you really want to get into the meat of things to start yourself off, one of the great books which I started off reading, looking at African high culture, it's called um, Introduction to African Civilizations by John G. Jackson. Excellent book to start you off, excellent book to start trying to build you, and then you can go into other realms. That's a good platform to really, really start. Books on slavery. Um, there's loads of books on slavery. Uh, Hugh Thomas, who's a, who's a Welsh author, he writes a fantastic book on slavery. He looks at the Treaty of Tordesillas. He looks at the beginning of the slave trade in the Portuguese and the Spanish. It's about four to 500 pages. It's a real thick book, but Hugh Thomas' book on, I think it's called The Slave Trade, I think it's called. So Hugh Thomas's book is good and it's really deep, it's, it's, it's balanced to a, to a large extent. And he, looks at Europe, and he looks at European trade, et cetera. And the last one which I will mention is um, Eric Williams's book, Capitalism and Slavery, which is a must read. It will, make, it, will feed into the, it will feed you into understanding how slavery, slaves' wealth fed into industrialization, okay? So I hope I've given you a lot of information there. Um, what was the other questions, please, Jessica, and I'll answer those. Um, the other question was, um, are schools and curriculum designers taking it seriously that history has been completely distorted to exclude the BAME voices and the stories? And how are you seeing things changing as you are feeding into these discussions? Right. It's going to be quite difficult for two reasons. First and foremost, the first difficulty which we're having or I'm having as an educational consultant is that the Welsh government, you know, in Wales, because you know there's going to be a curricular change by 2022. They only want to focus and give us the humanities program. So look at history and geography. And I think that's unfair because white history is presented in chemistry, physics, Okay, it's presented in biology, it's presented in geography, history, so it's presented in general science, and the list in drama and art, okay, and the list just goes on and on. So white history and white experience, it permeates through all these different subjects and disciplines. And my argument is if you're doing if you're giving white children or white pupils and students a holistic education of themselves in a curriculum, you could do the same for other ethnic groups or cultural groups within Britain. Because what you're doing is, if you're only gonna give us two subjects and you're giving white kids on all subjects, all the other subjects, what you're basically doing is giving them a 100% representation and education while we get less than 10%. And this is not classroom inclusivity, I'm sorry, it's not. So that is one of the main problems. And I think this is now sparking off major debate now because Europeans or white people have, 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 have not recognized to a large extent that they have been represented in every topic and every subject within schools, colleges, and universities. You've got to speak about people if you're speaking about chemistry. And the people, you know, you know about Copernicus and Galileo and all those other groups of people. But if I was to ask you, name me one Middle Eastern scholar from the past during that time. Name me an African scholar from that time who was a scientist. People would struggle. And they came before Copernicus and Galileo. So that's the first thing. There is an element of opposition from many parents and many teachers. And a lot of that opposition is based upon, well, we don't really need it. But the reality is they're not preparing their children for a global village. A global village is based upon different cultural groups of people living in the earth this is what this is about it's not the global village is not based upon white people only and this is what this is a mistake that they're making the educational system so i'm doing my bit in order to try to look at black history because black and african history is my expertise but i'm also want to see a multicultural educational curriculum so every child that is in those school systems within wales should be represented so we should talk about the time of the Moors or the Muslim expansion with the House of Wisdom that was opened in Baghdad, where Persian and Arabs pioneered science, 
philosophy, that should be in a curriculum because it predates the European experience. And not just that, that's how the Europeans plagiarized and understood because of the records that we had left back at that time. So I think, so there's a lot of work to do. I'm trying to do my bit and a curricular change is a must because we have been denied education for five centuries and we're still being denied an education by disproportionately being kicked out of the educational system through exclusions, uh, through exclusion rates within Wales and England. And we're not even appearing within the subject areas, but we're not allowed to complain. We have to complain because it's totally unfair that a white child gets a holistic education, every subject, and we are left on the sideline. And the only thing that we have to enjoy, uh, have to enjoy is Black History Month. Our history is an everyday experience. We've been there from the beginning of time as archaeological evidence and DNA has suggest, which means that we should be there anyway. We've been there from the beginning of time, and to omit us from that is falsifying history to, 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 to conceptually incarcerate people into believing we were nothing more than subordinate pariahs who were just slaves. So I hope I've answered your question. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Sadly, we are over time, so I'm going to have to wrap up the meeting. So thank you very much for being with us tonight, Abu Bakr. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much to my co-chairs, Abid and Arwa, and uh, our secretary, Izzy. Um, we are nothing without her. And thank you all for tuning in. And we hope to see you next week for the final series, um, series number four.